Welcome to the recorded version of Senior Nutrition and Mealtime, part of the Family Caregiver Support Webinar Series brought to you by the American Society on Aging and a generous sponsorship from Home Instead Senior Care. All right, today's webinar is being presented by Lakeland Hogan. She's going to be our presenter for today. Lakeland is a strategic partnerships representative for Home Instead Senior Care. She holds a graduate certificate in gerontology and is currently working toward a Master of Arts in Social Gerontology. She also holds a Master's in Business Administration and her undergraduate education focused on marketing and communication studies. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. She has worked on special projects for the University of Nebraska Omaha's Department of Gerontology and the local area agency on aging. She is serving in her second year as the co-chair of the Nebraska State Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association's Dementia Care Conference. Lakeland has spent several years assisting senior clients and helping their families navigate the senior care continuum. She is passionate about helping others, especially aging adults and their families. And with that, I'd like to welcome our presenter for today, Lakeland Hogan. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Steve. And I was actually just looking over the conference schedule for the Aging in America conference, and I was getting excited. There's some great topics. So I will be there and encourage you guys uh, to attend as well. And if you're there, I look forward to meeting you. Um, but again, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And before I dive into the topic, I just wanted to address um, a quick resource that was brought up in last month's webinar, if you were with us. There was a 211 phone number that somebody suggested that you call uh, to get resources for your local area and I researched it. It is an actual phone number that you can call or you can visit 211.org to get connected to your local Health and Human Services office um, and this is available throughout the entire United States. So whoever did share that resource, thank you so much for doing so and like Steve said at the end of this presentation, we'll have an opportunity to share more resources with one another and ask some more questions. So until then, let's dive into today's topic, senior nutrition and mealtime. I mean, nutrition is a topic that we actually hear a lot about in magazines, in the, on the internet, uh, in newspapers, and let's face it, food and nutrition are a big part of our culture and everyday lives. We place a significant emphasis on food and diets. We grocery shop, meal plan, we go out to eat at restaurants, and even our social events are centered around food. And I recently read a report by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They analyzed about three years of data and found, on average, we spend close to three hours a day eating and drinking. And half of that time is spent on various activities such as preparing the meal or driving to a restaurant. And I, I guess I didn't realize uh, how much time a day I spend eating, drinking, probably thinking about food, um, but it is a significant portion of our, our everyday lives. Uh, and when it comes to nutrition for older adults, family caregivers are busy helping their senior loved ones um, and aging adults in their lives. About 83% of family caregivers help with groceries and other errands, and 65% of family caregivers assist with meal preparation. So it seems like in almost every situation, or at least in half of uh, Care, family caregiver senior related situations, the family is helping the senior with nutrition. So what's causing our family caregiver to assist so much with meal preparation and grocery shopping? Well, as we age, it can present challenges to seniors' ability to maintain good nutrition, uh, also chronic illness and declining eyesight uh, or ch changes in our taste buds, um, and sometimes even isolation can affect nutritional habits, and we'll dive a little deeper into this uh, throughout the presentation. But knowing how important good nutrition and proper hydration is to all of us, as a person gets older, it's even more important. And a proper diet can have a huge impact on seniors' quality of life. So as we go through today's slides, you'll see uh, why good nutrition is so important. And as you can see, these objectives here that we'll cover um, today, again, we'll discuss why nutrition is important. We'll talk about the causes of malnutrition and some of the warning signs to look for when working with seniors. We'll also talk about tips and techniques to help older adults maintain proper nutrition, uh, everything from meal and hydration suggestions to shopping and making an event out of meal time. And then finally, we'll talk about some specific chronic illnesses that have additional impacts on nutrition, such as Alzheimer's disease and diabetes. So let's talk some through of these, <clears throat> pardon me, talk through some of these physical factors that influence nutrition here on the next slide. The first of these physical factors is chronic illness. As we age, our bodies and internal systems will slow and change. 
illnesses can occur that require some modification in what we can or cannot eat. Often we don't have the same stamina that we had even in midlife and our metabolism has slowed with age. And when seniors have a chronic illness, such as arthritis, they may have continual pain. And this pain might affect their ability to shop for food and prepare it. Maybe they can't stand for long periods of time. Maybe uh, their arthritis prevents them from being able to chop up some of the food that they need to make a meal or even stir a pot on the stove for long periods of time. So these can prevent um, some challenges. And chronic illnesses might also suppress appetite and uh, this is significant because people with chronic illness, it's even, of course it's important for every senior to get new, good nutritious meals, but it's especially important for those who have chronic illnesses. Uh, so another issue that you might face when working with seniors is trouble with chewing and swallowing. And dental problems are a very common factor that affect nutrition. If a senior has poorly fitted dentures or a lot of cavities or gum problems, it can affect the taste of the food and their ability to chew. And dry mouth is also something to consider. It can be a side effect of different medications or diseases such as Parkinson's disease. And then another factor is absorption. You know, the, the product of certain digestive enzymes and acids diminish as we age. And this makes it harder to break down proteins and absorb key vitamins in our bodies such as B12, folate, and sometimes even calcium or iron. And when the body can't absorb those crucial vitamins, it can impact the nervous system. And when that nervous system is impacted, it can lead to an unsteady gait for a senior, muscle weakness, mental alertness, and poor circulation, which we know are definitely uh, significant when it comes to aging adults. And also medications can cause some physical factors. Like I mentioned earlier, they, it can suppress the appetite, it might alter the taste of food, and can even cause nausea and vomiting in some cases. And multiple medications used together can have an even bigger effect. Antibiotics also affect the absorption and effectiveness of medication. And then what if a senior is hospitalized? That can have some effects on, on um, physical aspects of nutrition. The trauma and stress of a hospitalization might lead to a loss of appetite or a generalized weakness. And oftentimes you just don't feel good when you come home from the hospital. You don't want to get up and move around, especially to cook or go to the grocery store. And you know, that's a time when nutrition and hydration is key. It's after you get out of the hospital and proper nutrition and hydration can actually lessen the need for readmissions. Um, so it's really important. And then taste and smell can be a, a, a physical factor that can influence our nutrition. And sensory loss is a normal part of aging. But let's face it, food is all about comfort and enjoyment. So not being able to taste the flavor can lead to poor nutrition. And medications can sometimes decrease the sense of smell for seniors. And I know for myself, if I'm kind of sick and have a stuffy nose, if I can't smell, a lot of times food doesn't taste good to me, so I don't even want to eat. And seniors may experience something similar. But they might try to add sugar or salt to improve the taste, which could also be harmful to their health. So it's something to keep in mind. And then finally, lower levels of activity um, can cause loss of muscle and fat can cause a loss of appetite due to changes in our body chemistry. So not eating enough or not eating the right things can also cause a decrease in our energy level. And think about the last time you ate a meal that wasn't so good for you or if you skipped lunch, how did that make you feel? I know for me, I might get tired and spacey. I really am lacking energy. But if I'm up and moving around, if I'm exercising, I feel the opposite. I'm, I'm becoming more hungry. So when you burn energy and calories, um, it creates that, that sensation of being hungry. And if activity levels are low, especially in seniors, that same sensation is not being created. So it can definitely be a physical factor influencing nutrition. On this next slide here, let's look at some of the social factors that can influence seniors' nutrition habits. So the first of these social factors is depression. If a senior is feeling low or depressed, it could be due to loneliness or illness. It could also be due to a lack of mobility. And they might also be depressed because of a recent loss of maybe a spouse, a family member, or friend. And with depression, your mood can have an effect on nutrition. You might not feel like eating. So that's definitely a social factor to keep in mind. And another thing is limited income. 
a lot of our seniors that we're working with on a day-to-day -day basis are on fixed incomes, which can cause them to choose lower cost food items. And unfortunately, in many cases, those are not always the healthiest picks. Uh, the other thing to consider with an, a limited income is the cost of medication. And if a senior is forced to choose between going grocery shopping or picking up their medication, the meds usually win in the end. So that's a factor to keep in mind. And then finally, restricted diets. Seniors are more likely than any other group to have dietary restrictions whether it's uh, they have to limit their salt, fat, or sugar intake. And these uh, limitations, of course, they're necessary for m uh, managing their chronic conditions, but they can also be bland and unappealing. And so that might cause an older, older adult to stop eating. And also these restrictions might be hard to adhere to in a social gathering or in a social setting. So they might go by the wayside and affect the senior's overall nutrition. And what about socializing? Does that influence nutrition? Let's look at that here on the next slide. For most seniors, it's not what's on their plate that matters most at mealtime, it's who is at the table. So reduced social contact, contact and solidarity can lead to a life of loneliness, uh, and it has a big impact on nutrition, so it's another social factor. And social contact has an a positive effect effect on eating. It also increases morale and well-being. If you think about it, eating is an activity that we rarely do in isolation. It's a very social activity uh, associated with various rituals in our culture. So if you think about your own family, do you have a special restaurant you go to for a birthday or a celebration? Maybe you gather together around a meal or uh, cook special dishes around holidays. These special occasions only take place a handful of times a year, so being more aware of who's at the table with the senior outside of those special occasions is important. And it's almost just as, um, just as important as what they're eating. So the social impact of nutritious meals is important, and I want to dive a little deeper into this topic. In North America, Home Instead Inc. completed a survey of 1,000 households in the U.S. and Canada. And they wanted to identify the status of family sit-down dinners with senior relatives of at least 70 years of age and older. And let's take, take a look on the next slide at the results of this survey. As you can see, the survey shows that 59% of family members who live nearby their aging loved one do not have Sunday dinner with their relatives. We also found that 43% do not think their senior loved one is eating nutritious and balanced meals. And of those surveyed, almost half report that their senior loved one generally eats alone. I don't know about you, but when I eat alone, I'm certainly less likely to cook something uh, nutritious and more likely to grab something of questionable nutritional value. Maybe I'll grab fast food or uh, eat something prepackaged like a lean cuisine or a TV dinner. And it's far easier when I'm by myself to just do something quick rather than what is nutritious. And so the same can be done for seniors. So when we were going through the survey, we asked families why they aren't eating together. And the survey found 52% of families have conflicting schedules. It's just hard to get together. And 40% of them say that they just don't have enough time. And I know sit-down fam family dinners are, it's hard to wrangle everyone together for a meal. Um, and it's becoming a lost art with all the activities that people are involved with and all the distractions of TVs and cell phones. People really have stopped eating meals together regularly. But I've done some research on this topic and the bottom line is that food just tastes better when you share a meal with someone. So not only is sharing a meal together important when it comes to senior nutrition, it's also important to know the warning signs of poor nutrition in seniors. So let's look on the next slide at a summary of these uh, warning signs. The first warning sign of poor nutrition is loss of appetite. If an older adult has always been a hearty eater but no longer eats as he or she used to, it's time to find out why. There might be an underlying illness that could be the root cause, or it could be a problem of ill-fitting dentures or pain while chewing. So there might be another cause to why they're not eating like they used to. There could also be changes in mood. We talked about depression earlier, but it's a common sign of poor nutrition. Feeling down can cause a person not to eat, so keep an eye out for these mood changes. And also notice flighty or spacey behavior when a person just kind of seems out of it. 
it could be a sign that they're not getting proper nutrition. Next would be a sudden fluctuation in weight. Weight change of losing or gaining about 10 pounds over six months could mean that something's going on. And it might be a little hard to spot 10 pounds, but look for cues in clothing choices. You know, if your aging loved one's belt is, uh, is they're putting new notches on the belt uh, because their, their pants are starting to fall down more, or maybe they're wearing the same couple outfits every other day, um, that might be due to the fact that their clothes aren't fitting anymore. That could indicate some, some weight gain or weight loss. And another thing to keep your eye out for is skin tone. When older adults are eating properly, their skin should look healthy and well hydrated. On the other hand, ashy or dull looking skin is a sign of poor nutrition. So that can be an easy sign that you can look out for. And also cognitive problems or change in cognition can be another sign. Older people who live alone might forget to eat or choose not to eat. Dementia and cognitive problems can also lead to nutritional deficiencies and dehydration as they might eat or drink less forget or refuse. And I'll provide more insight on tips for those with Alzheimer's or dementia later on in the presentation. And medication is something else to look out for. When a person is taking more than three medications, it can influence both appetite and weight. Suggest that they or a family member check with their doctor to find out if medications could be the culprit. And it might be time for some basic medication reconciliation, just making sure that none of the drugs are interacting negatively for that senior. Another warning sign of poor nutrition could be a recent illness or hospital stay. If a person has been in bed for several days recovering at home or in a, in a hospital setting, they might be weak. And proper nutrition can give them the energy to be feeling better and get back to their old self and recover faster. So make sure that the older adult family members and professionals are involved in monitoring their recovery to make sure that they're eating properly and getting back to their, their old self. Poor nutrition can also lead to anemia and muscle weakness, which could lead to falls and fractures. So if a person is more tired or lethargic, it might also be a sign that there is poor nutrition happening. So if you spot any of these signs or a family member tells you about these signs, what can you do to help? Let's look at some solutions here on this next slide. Encourage families to start talking to the individual. If we really listen to what's going on in the older adult's life that may be contributing to or causing poor eating habits, we're much more likely to be able to help generate solutions together that will resolve the situation. As we know, many older adults are reluctant to talk openly about issues because they might be embarrassed or feel like it's not important. And that's something to keep in mind when discussing the effects of nutrition on a senior's health and quality of life. But more often than not, no one has taken the time to assess the issue with the older adult and help them find the solution. Many people are surprised to learn that some health issues they are having might be easily cleared up with some simple dietary changes. So the very best thing we can do is have an open conversation with the older adults we work with and when appropriate, involve the family caregiver. And getting the family involved, involved is especially important if a person has cognitive impairments, if the family is the one doing the grocery shopping and meal preparation, or simply if the senior wants them involved. So the goal of involving the family is always the same. It's to support the independence and quality of life of the client and not to compromise their independence. So if meds, medications are to blame for, or illness, it would be good to visit a doctor and make sure to bring a medication list not only the prescription drugs that the senior is taking, but also over-the-counter drugs, vitamins, and supplements. That might be key in helping the physician figure out what's going on. The family might also want to, uh, to visit with the dietitian or nutritionist. And these professionals seem to be more readily available in our communities. I know in the community I live in, many of our grocery stores have a dietitian on staff, and anyone can set up a meeting with them. And it's very helpful to get an idea of what foods are good and um, if any dietary restrictions are in place, tips on how to incorporate that into the diet. And lastly, if the family thinks poor nutrition is due to dental, denture, or jaw problems, suggest that the older client makes a visit to the dentist. I know I worked with an individual who had 
ill-fitting dentures. And it was really causing her uh, to be limited in the food she could eat. And it, she have also had difficulty talking to other people because her dentures were falling out. And she had recently lost a lot of weight. So the son took her to get some new dentures, and that solved the entire problem. She was able to eat just about anything she wanted, and she was able to talk to people better. I just noticed her entire mood lifted. So again, it could be a simple fix, such as a trip to the dentist. In addition to consuming, or sorry, consulting medical and nutritional professionals, there's also other things you can do to educate and support the older adult you're working with to eat properly and have better nutrition. So on the next slide, let's look at the nutritional guidelines for seniors before we get into some tips and techniques. The first important nutritional guideline is to reduce sodium. A reduction in sodium can prevent water retention and high blood pressure. It's also important to monitor fat intake. You can educate seniors about the good fats versus the bad fats. Some, the fats from olive oil, avocados, and salmon, for example, can protect the body against heart disease by controlling the bad cholesterol levels and raising the good cholesterol levels. It's also important to consume more calcium and vitamin D. Calcium is very important to bone health, and vitamin D promotes the absorption of calcium in the body. The National Osteoporosis Foundation listed some foods that are naturally high in calcium. And they listed things such as collard greens, kale, oranges, broccoli, soybeans or edamame, and of course dairy products such as milk, yogurt, and cheese. Foods high in vitamin D are the foods such as salmon, tuna, sardines, shiitake mushrooms, eggs, and cod liver oil, if you can stomach it. <laughs> and of course, to get it's best to get vitamins and nutrients directly from natural foods. However, you can con consult the doctor to discuss whether supplements are best suited for the specific health needs of the senior. Another good nutritional guideline is to eat more fiber, and I think we've all heard that it helps with constipation. So some foods that are dense, with, dense in fiber are berries, prunes, beans or lentils, broccoli, nuts and seeds, apples, sweet potatoes, and dried fruit. So those are some some easy foods that you can eat to help with constipation and digestion. And then finally, participate in regular physical activity, about 30 minutes, three times a week. And seniors don't have to join a gym in order to get physical activity. They can walk around the neighborhood if the weather's nice. They can get up and move about the house, do some chair exercises. Anything that's active for 30 minutes will make a big difference. And overall, eating healthy and physically Having physical activity in your life can keep an older person's body and mind sharp and extend their quality of life. So now that we've reviewed some of the special nutrition, nutritional needs seniors have, let's look specifically at hydration guidelines on the next slide. Dehydration has been associated with many elderly health issues, including elderly confusion, impaired cognition, falls, urinary tract infections, and constipation. An important guideline to consider is don't wait until you're thirsty to drink. Drink frequently. You can even think of drinking water as a prescription. Drink eight ounces a day with your morning pills. It's a great way to start your day. And Dr. Connie Bales at Duke University Medical Center recommends that older adults drink about six glasses of water per day, especially those in warmer climates. So encourage seniors to drink fluids with each meal and each snack. They also can keep water close within arm's reach at all times. Some suggestions for that, maybe carry around a special bottle, uh, one that's easy to use uh, with an, a lid that's easy to open. Uh, for those that get intimidated by large glasses of water, use small juice glasses or Dixie cups and refill them frequently. You'll end up drinking more fluids than you realize. For those that just need a little something extra in their water, adding a splash of white grape juice or cranberry juice or fresh fruit such as lemons or limes can make a big difference and make it taste a lot better. And for a little fizz, try some sparkling mineral water. And for me, I found that I started drinking more water when I had a Brita pitcher or a filtered water pitcher in my fridge. I, that by doing that, I always had cold water around and I found myself filling the glass more often. So that's a suggestion you could make to the older adults you work with. Water-based fruits, such as watermelon, can also help seniors get additional fluid intake 
in addition to hydrating snacks such as jello, soups, pudding, popsicles, smoothies, and milk milkshakes such as Ensure. Those Ensure shakes have some additional vitamins and minerals in it too. But something to avoid is sweet and soft drinks or sports drinks and even sweet fruit juice. For those fruit juices, look for reduced sugar options or 100% juice. And then advise that the seniors watch their coffee or caffeine intake. Catherine Zarafsky, a registered dietitian at the Mayo Clinic, said consuming 500 milligrams of caffeine or more a day could put you at risk of dehydration. And that equates to about three to five cups of coffee. And I know my own grandparents drink a ton of coffee. They always have with every meal ever since I was little. And I've encouraged them to drink a cup of water in between cups of coffee or switch to decaf later in the day. And this has been extremely helpful for them. And a fun fact, my grandpa's the one pictured on, on this slide here and he's drinking his water, so he's doing a good job. And if incontinence is an issue for seniors, encourage them to drink water earlier in the day to avoid frequent bathroom trips at nighttime. So now that we have good guidelines for hydration, let's get back to nutrition with some tips on cooking on the next slide. Obviously, having all of this good food doesn't do an older adult any good if they don't enjoy cooking it or eating it. A nutritional expert at the University of Maryland suggests that making mealtime a happy event can make a big difference. Sometimes we focus so much on what we can't eat we don't focus on the positive. Food is all about the aroma, the color, feel, texture, and about socializing. All of this makes mealtime more enjoyable. So for some tips on cooking, try to avoid foods with empty calories. These are foods where the calories come from solid fats, added sugars, and have no nutrients. So some examples would be sodas, sweets, and chips. And for those dealing with mouth or gum issues, soups are food that require less chewing is a good idea. Soups are especially easy to prepare. They provide leftovers and some additional hydration. Also, mix up meals. Many people love to have breakfast any time of the day, but don't think to do it. As a kid, I loved breakfast for dinner and still do. So you can remind older adults that it's just a made up idea that some foods have to be eaten at a certain time of the day. They might want to try vegetable soup and a tuna sandwich for breakfast or an omelet, muffin, and fresh fruit for dinner. That's completely fine. The goal is a variety of healthy foods, and it doesn't matter what time of day they are eaten. And as we know, variety is the spice of life, and that really is true with food. So encourage the seniors and their families to plan and prepare a variety of foods, and that can help the older adults stay interested in eating. And if food tastes too bland, suggest that they try some natural flavor enhancers that are also good for them. Some of these could be olive oil, vinegars, garlic, onion, and spices. Some good spices to include are cinnamon, cloves, and ginger. And some fresh squeezed lemon or lime can give food added flavor. And these spices are especially good for those who need to cut back on salt. There are some great seasoning mixes out there like Mrs. Dash that are salt free. So those can be good options for some seniors. It might take some time to, to get used to these substitutes, but the goal is to move into the right dire move to the right direction in terms of eating and not seniors don't have to be perfect right off the bat. Another great idea is, is to help assemble healthy snacks at home that are easily accessible. So foods such as nuts and seeds low-fat cottage cheese, fresh veggies and fruits that are already cut up, they can be put into small ready-to-eat containers or baggies, and they can do this rather than buying the less healthy and more expensive pre-packaged and processed snacks. The senior or family member can also do some batch cooking when time and money allow. For example, cook a large amount of spaghetti sauce and divide it into small portions, freeze it, and use it later in the month. Or make a big batch of soup in a crock pot and freeze it in in individual portions. That, that way, the next time you don't feel like cooking, you can pull one out of, out of the freezer, pop it in the microwave, and you have a healthy, delicious meal. This is especially great in the winter months. Another idea is to take advantage of planned leftovers. This cuts down on preparation time and saves food dollars. For example, prepare several chicken breasts, eat one for dinner, and then use the rest later in the week to make a quick soup or a stir fry with veggies. You can see that planning and organizing 
are key to good nutritional habits. So cooking is important, but so is the grocery shopping. On the next slide, let's talk through some tips for successful grocery shopping with older adults. It's important to keep in mind that the goal is to get seniors involved in mealtime and not do everything for them, allowing them to not only have a say in the foods they eat, but involve them, involve them in the process can help them understand the importance of good nutrition and also gives them some stake in the game. As basic as it sounds, many people do not know how to make trips to the grocery store more organized and productive. This is especially true if someone has never done the grocery shopping or meal planning before and is now forced to because they've lost a spouse. Here are some tips you can share with older clients or their family members about how to improve grocery shopping. And again, these tips sound quite basic, but put yourself in the shoes of an older adult who may never have had this role in their lives. A little bit of simple guidance can go a long way. So the first tip is to make a list. If they can begin to figure out what they'd like to eat for a week's time, the pre-planning can help them to reduce the time and money spent on food shopping. And if you're stumped on meal ideas, I'm going to offer some great resources at the end of the presentation. And then the next tip, we've probably all heard this one before, and probably have also experienced the consequences of doing so, but it's best not to shop hungry. We know that people are much more tempted to buy things they wouldn't normally buy if they shop hungry. And the next would be to review store ads, clip coupons, and organize them at home. Clearly, shopping with coupons can save people a lot of money, and for seniors on a fixed income, this can be especially important. Knowing that they are saving money may help, the reduce, may help to reduce the stress and cost of shopping. And for the tech-savvy seniors or adult children, sign up for the store's bonus or discount card. This can help older adults reap additional savings and take advantage of grocery store specials. I know here at my local grocery store, every Wednesday they have a 5% senior discount. Your local grocery store might have the same thing, so it's worth a phone call, never hurts to ask. You could also suggest that a senior sticks to the perimeter of the grocery store. That's where most of the fresh, healthier foods are located. The inner aisles have more of the prepared and processed foods. You could also encourage the senior client to try the store brands. They're often cheaper and just as delicious. And finally, encourage seniors to try new foods, even different ethnic, pardon me, ethnic foods. Um, one suggestion is to try one new food a week, and this has gotten easier in the recent years. Most grocery stores now label the more unusual fruits and vegetables and suggest how they can be prepared and how they taste. Last time I was at the grocery store, I picked up some purple cauliflower just because it was unique and different, and it tasted just about the same, and it was something fun and different. So after sharing these suggestions, you might want to also recommend having healthy food staples on hand. So let's look at what those important staples might be. On the next slide, sorry. <laughs> In general, there are, there are staples that the older client shouldn't live without. They may seem like common foods for any healthy diet, but these foods hold special nutritional value for older adults and can be used in a variety of recipes. Let's look at the list. First is oatmeal. You probably know that oatmeal is a great source of fiber and has been shown to help lower cholesterol and may also re reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. And yeah, obviously this is important for older adults. Next is eggs. With only 75 calories per serving, eggs contain 13 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D. And as we talked about earlier, that's important for absorbing calcium. They also can be prepared in a variety of ways. Yogurt is the next one. It's rich in calcium and can contribute to the calcium requirements needed to prevent osteoporosis. There's also good bacteria added to some yogurt, which will help digestive, with digestive problems. Greek yogurt is really popular right now and has even more protein than regular yogurt. And plain Greek yogurt can be used as a substitute for sour cream in many recipes and tastes just about the same. A good fruit to have on hand is blueberries. They're among the top fruits and vegetables for antioxidants. Research on aging and Alzheimer's disease reveal that blueberries may also improve memory and coordination. And they can be purchased fresh or frozen. And 
the old saying goes, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So that's another good fruit to have on hand. And the benefits of apples are numerous. In particular, the pectin in apples lower the body's need for insulin and may help manage diabetes in older people. Next would be fish. Bluefish, mackerel, salmon, sardines, trout, and tuna are all low-fat, high-protein sources of nutrients. The American Heart Association recommends that fatty fish be eaten twice a week to improve heart health. There has also been a bit of research on improved brain health with regular fish consumption. Another good protein is poultry or chicken. It's an excellent source of protein and contains less fat than most meats. It's also very versatile and could be cooked a hundred different ways. Broccoli is a good vegetable to have on hand because it's a source of multiple nutrients including vitamins K, C, E, B, calcium, and iron. And broccoli has been found to protect, protect against cancer, heart disease, stroke, and macular degeneration. Sweet potatoes and squash are also good to have on hand. Sweet potatoes provide beta carotene, vitamins C and E, all of which promote healthy skin, hair, and eyesight. Be careful not to make them even more sweet with brown sugar, it's hard to resist, but instead try some spices. I love to roast sweet potatoes with extra virgin olive oil and some seasoning, such as pumpkin pie seasoning or a little cayenne pepper and chili powder. I'm making myself hungry here. Um, but, and then the next one is rice. A complex hydrate, rice digests slowly, allowing the body to utilize energy released over a long period of time, which is nutritionally efficient. And we can't forget dessert. And I'm sure most of you are aware that dark chocolate, when consumed in moderation, may contribute to heart or heart pardon me, to health benefits such as boosting the good cholesterol and lowering blood pressure. And that's all despite the fact that it's high in calorie and a high fat food. But again, the key is moderation. So you can have a little chocolate at the end of the meal. So we know the guidelines and we have some tips to share with families on meal preparation and planning. But I'd like to get back to that family dinner concept we talked about here on the next slide. So sometimes it can be difficult to engage seniors in family meal time. Here are some tips on how to make an older adult feel more a part of family dinner. The first is to create nostalgic meals. Familiar meals can help an elderly person stay engaged to their past and can bring back happy memories. You can also get them involved in choosing the recipes or the theme of the dinner. You could propose an Italian or Mexican themed dinner. Also involve the senior in meal prep. Even if they can't stand up for long periods of time, seat them at the table close by and have them tear up the lettuce for the salad or measure out the ingredients for baking. And when it comes to actually sitting down together, make sure that the senior is in a spot where they're most likely to participate in conversation, perhaps at the middle of the table or at the head of the table. Also invite them to share stories and even come prepared with a few topics like their favorite summer vacation or best childhood birthday or Christmas present. And if children are involved in mealtime, have them bring something special for the senior, like a handmade card or have them share their latest school project. And there are a few more tips on the next slide that you may help find helpful as a family caregiver. Now, not everyone has family that lives close by. And if that is the case, and if the senior can't shop on their own, there are a number of, po of possibilities for assisting seniors depending on their living situation, finances, and needs. The first tip is uh, that today, many grocery stores have delivery services. You can check online or give the, the grocer a call to see if they accept orders by phone or online. Another option is to suggest, that family member, suggest to the family member or to the senior that they ask a friend, a neighborhood teen, or even a college student to see if they'd be willing to do some of the shopping in exchange for sharing a meal. This provides for two needs at once. First if the groceries bought for the week, and second, it provides companionship at mealtime for your senior loved one. Another option is setting up home care services through a professional firm. These services can most likely do the shopping and meal preparation for a fee. And again, companionship during mealtime can be another benefit of the service. Some community area agencies on aging might have a Meals on Wheels program. That's a great option. These nutritious meals are provided to homebound, disabled, or individuals that would otherwise be unable to maintain their dietary needs. 
these programs have been a godsend for decades. And the daily delivery generally consists of two meals, a nutritionally balanced hot meal at lunchtime and a cold dinner consisting of a sandwich, milk, and some sides. In an effort to both cover costs and maintain the elder's sense of dignity, programs usually ask for a donation or charge a small fee based on the individual's income or ability to pay. And if it's companionship that would make meals more enjoyable for the loved one, there are a number of options out there to consider. First, you can contact your local senior center, YMCA, religious congregation, or high school and ask about their senior meal programs. You can also encourage the senior loved one to invite over friends or acquaintances to share a potluck dinner or lunch. And they even could set up a weekly coffee or breakfast meeting with family or friends to get socializing. Or your family could rotate a Sunday dinner once a week. All right, let's talk for a minute on the next slide about a few diseases that may affect nutrition even more. We talked about diabetes a little bit already, but according to the American Diabetes Association, more than 18% of people over the age of 60 have diabetes, which equates to about 8.6 million Americans. The prevalence of the disease increases with age, and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes also increases with age. Older adults face unique diabetic challenges, especially those with type 2 diabetes. As they age, the aging causes a decline in insulin production and an increase in glucose intolerance. Older Americans with diabetes are also more likely to have complicating conditions, such as hypertension and kidney problems. Nutritional management of diabetes usually involves dietary changes that balance moderation, carbohydrate control, and healthy eating choices. People with diabetes need to focus on foods that are high in fiber and nutrient dense. The internet is also loaded with helpful information on healthy senior nutrition. The Diabetes Association has a great guide for adults 55 age, years of age and older. Some tips they recommend are starting meals with salad or broth-based soup, choosing veggies and fruits as a side, avoid buffets, and share a dessert, even though that sometimes is difficult. Uh, and the good news is that the best diet for a person with diabetes is really the same kind of healthy eating that is best for everyone. Another area where nutrition pre presents unique challenges is when a person has Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So let's look at that on the next slide. Eating and drinking habits may change with dementia. We must encourage families to stick to routines to ensure success. For example, eat breakfast at the same time each day, and in some cases, eating the same foods can provide comfort. Getting a senior to drink enough liquids to stay hydrated may also be a difficult task. As the disease progresses, even swallowing can become a problem and the use of appliances or utensils may be a concern. These types of changes make proper nutrition challenging for a person with Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. So here's a few tips. Continue food traditions. It's a great way to keep the senior engaged in eating. Try to offer foods they are familiar with as long as they are safe and appropriate to eat. Finger friendly foods are a great way to modify or simplify a meal and avoid the confusion of utensil use. And setting a simple table can be very helpful. You might want to avoid patterned dishes, placemats, and tablecloths. Patterns can be confusing, especially as vision worsens, and it can create distractions when the person is eating. Consider serving just one dish at a time. For example, if the menu is soup and sandwich, try serving the first soup first and then the sandwich second, and limit the number of utensils used to serve. And look to create contrast on the dinner plate. A person might not be able to see turkey, potatoes, and cauliflower on a white plate, so instead consider a colored plate. And be descriptive. If the person doesn't recognize what they're eating, describe each item on the plate. Also, you can describe the location of the food on the plate like a clock such as your carrots are at 3 o'clock and your chicken is at 9 o'clock. Also, you can model for the person. If they're unsure what to do with their utensils, show them by picking up your own spoon and eating from your dish. And if that doesn't work, put the spoon in their hand and guide their hand to the mouth. Or if they have crumbs on their shirt, wipe your own shirt, hope, hoping that they will model what you're doing, just like we do with our own family and friends. And knowing routines and food preferences can be helpful, especially when there are multiple caregivers in, in the, the caregiving situation. 
consider keeping a journal to track what they like to eat for different meals. You can also track how much they eat and when they eat, which is important because with Alzheimer's or dementia, they might forget that they just ate. And then also adapt tableware. If food keeps falling off the plate, use a bowl or cups with lids and straws can ensure fewer spills. The key is to keep the dignity intact of the older adult. Offer them simple choices and ask before assisting them to cut up their food before you reach across the table to help. On the next slide, we're going to wrap up here with some resources. The first is a registered dietitian, especially for those with food restrictions and those with diabetes. For diabetics, it's important to look for a dietitian who is also a certified diabetes educator or who has experience in the diabetic care. Registered dietitians can provide individualized menu planning and education on food choices. I also recommend other government sites such as the National Institute for Health. They have a great what's on your plate guide. And the USDA has a great website, nutrition.gov. And for Meals on Wheels program, contact your local area agency on aging. And if you're unsure how to reach out, visit n4a.org. And for those with diabetes, the American Diabetes Association is a great resource. Some additional websites are cravingcompanionship.com and foodforseniors.com. And if you're stumped for meals, as I mentioned earlier, caregiverstress.com has some great resources if you search meal plan. There you can find delicious meal plans, recipes, and shopping lists prepared by a licensed nutritionist. And there are fall, winter, spring, and summer meals that use fresh and frozen foods depending on the season. They also have a breakdown of calories, and they use all food groups, so it's a great resource. Again, caregiverstress.com, and on that site, search meal plan. So we talked about the nutritional guidelines, physical and social challenges, and also learned how to keep the senior involved in mealtime. So I hope you've taken away some good information, uh, and I want to open it up for some questions. I know I kind of went over a little bit, so we only have about 10 minutes, but uh, Steve, I'll turn it back to you for some questions that we might have. All right. Thanks very much, Lakeland. Excellent presentation. Okay, everybody, it is time for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. So text us in those questions and we will get to them, anything that is on your mind or you want to talk to uh, Lakeland here about. Um, the first question here, can you talk a little bit more about restricting uh, dry foods? You were talking about that a little bit before. Um, the types of foods, why, et cetera. Restricting dry foods. Well, for some seniors, uh, dry foods can, cho can uh, cause choking hazard, especially if swallowing is an issue. Um, so I, I would consult a dietitian on what foods would be better alternatives. Uh, but, you know, if a senior is eating some dry foods such as like breads or cereals without like a milk on top of them, it might cause uh, them to choke um, just because they're not, there's no liquid to accompany that. Or maybe if they uh, have lower levels of saliva, it might be just difficult to um, get those items chewed up. So as as far as specific uh, examples of dry foods, I would say, you know, breads, um, those chips, cereals, um, those types of things. So, and encouraging sips of water between each bite can also help reduce any choking or swallowing hazards um, with those drier foods. Okay, and can you just remind us again really quick, what was the last resource that you mentioned about good meal plans? Yes, it is. If you go to caregiverstress.com, again, caregiverstress.com, it's all one word. You could probably Google it, too. Um, and then on that site, if you search for meal plan, just type in meal plan in the search bar, those meal plans will come up. And they are awesome. I've even tried a few of them, and they're delicious, uh, very nutritious, and all of the ingredients are right there. It will even come up with a shopping list for you. Um, so, again, a really, really great resource, caregiverstress.com, and then on there, search meal plan. Okay. Um, next question for you here, Lakeland. When alone most of the day, do you have any tips for older adults who can be to remind them to eat if no one else is around to help them, help them do that? Yeah, that is a great question. Well, if, if the family caregiver is able to call the senior, and remind them that it's time to eat, that can be helpful. 
you can also utilize uh, a type of an alarm system. So if the senior has a cell phone, for example, you could set an alarm for noon, and then that alarm would go off reminding the senior. Um, and if it's, I know it's not always possible, but if a family caregiver could swing by at lunchtime or have a neighbor run over just to make sure that they've put, put something in the microwave or heat, heated something up for lunch, that's always a good option. Um, and if it's possible um, to hire a home care company, maybe have a caregiver hop in at lunchtime and make the senior some food if they're needing a little more assistance, that's always a good option. Okay, um, Lake, when you were talking earlier about um, sugars and especially how they relate to um, particular uh, diseases like diabetes, things like this, mm -hmm. um, it seemed, the question is, it seems like there is hidden sugar in everything, mm -hmm. um, processed foods, tons of sugar all over the place and everything, even a lot of things that you wouldn't think necessarily have uh, sugar, uh, it's in there. How do we communicate better with our older adults and our clients about uh, being paying more attention to the labels and actually, you know, f figuring out and learning how much sugar they are consuming a lot of times inadvertently. Yeah, that is a great comment. There are so many um, things that we eat every day that has extra sugar thrown in there. That's why it's so important to eat whole foods and to make your food yourself, which I know is not always the most convenient. Um, but um, in, in terms of the education uh, for seniors, getting them to, un um, making sure that they're able to read nutritional labels. So if um, they need um, a magnifying glass, kind of showing them on the food label where it says that there is sugar. Also educating, if they, um, if you kind of talk through their normal diet with them, you can kind of, because a lot of seniors, they do eat the same thing every day and that it's good to get them to get out of that routine. But if you're trying to initially educate them, kind of ask what foods they're eating every day and then kind of talk through how much sugar is in those items. Um, and, and for those that are diabetic, there are a lot of nice sugar-free options. Uh, stevia is um, a sugar substitute that can be used nowadays that uh, is better than the original or the processed sugar, white sugar. So um, there are some alternatives out there. And you're right, educating them, it really just takes somebody sitting down and giving them reminders. Um, and if there, if the individual has some cognitive problems or maybe they have a form of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, then really, um, and if they, especially if they need to limit their sugar, we need to get those really sugary foods out of arm's reach. So store those foods in, in a locked cabinet or up high, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so again, it, it really just gets back to sitting down and talking with them, uh, showing them where on the nutritional label uh, they can find the ingredients and the sugar count. Great question. Okay, uh, next question, Lakeland. What is your take or your opinion on the nutritional value of high fructose, fructose corn syrup? My opinion on high fructose corn syrup, well, I am not a registered dietitian, but I just in, in what I've learned, it's best to, uh, I think, uh, avoid that. Maybe getting sugars from natural foods, such as fruits, um, is a better alternative than high fructose corn syrup. So if it is avoidable, I know it is in a lot of the processed foods that are out there, but if it's avoidable, uh, if you can eat a piece of fruit instead of a processed sugary snack, that's always the best option. But it is hard because it is in a lot of foods that we eat. But because nutrition is such a hot topic, a lot of the, the food manufacturers are trying to reduce the amount of sugar or switching to more natural sugar options. Okay, um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what uh, some, of the, some of the fruits are that are easiest for older adults to eat? I would say the, the softer fruits, so bananas are easy to eat. Um, anything that doesn't need to be cut up, or if you're able to cut up the fruit and have it in a ready-to-go container for seniors, that makes it really easy. I mentioned blueberries earlier. Those are easy to prepare. You really just have to rinse them off, and then you, you can grab a handful and just eat them. Uh, raspberries are the same way. Uh, bananas, apples, and oranges are a little more difficult just because the apples, if seniors have dentures or sensitive teeth, it might be hard for them to bite into an apple. So it's best to cut those up. For an orange, for some people with arthritic hands, it's a little harder to peel them. So again, if you're able to prepare um, 
the fruit ahead of time, cut it up for them, um, that sort of thing, and put it in little containers. It's easiest for them to access. And a lot of the grocery stores now do that for you. There's a prepared food aisle. I know it's a little more pricey, but um, for those seniors that really are don't have anyone around to cut up the fruit for them, that's a really nice option is to grab one of those pre-chopped containers of pineapple and strawberries and all those yummy fruits. But um, the ones that require the least amount, I think, would be, you know, the bananas, the blueberries, raspberries, because they're easy to open and to eat. Good question. Okay, um, and we were talking a little bit about uh, hidden sugars earlier, this, uh, end of this other end of the spectrum here. Can you talk a little bit about hidden salt, especially in soups um, that are good for seniors? Um, I know I've looked at uh, labels sometimes and been absolutely astounded at how much sodium is in uh, particularly canned foods, prepackaged foods and things like that. What are some of the problems with that and how can we work with that with our older clients as well? You're right. I've I've done the same thing. I've I've looked at the soup cans, and a lot of them do have a lot of sodium. That's why if if it's an option um, to cook or make your own soup, that way you know exactly how much salt you're adding. That's the best option, I would say. Um, and even when I make my soups, if it calls for chicken broth, I always use the reduced sodium option. Um, so if you're able to make your own soup, which I know. Time is of the essence, so if you have to grab something off of the shelf, always go for the reduced sodium option. Um, but there is so much sodium in everything that we eat, so it is something that we definitely have to keep our eye out for. And on that caregiverstress.com website, there, the uh, meals on those meal plans, um, they do have all of the dietary restrictions on them, and the nutritionist uh, made them with that exact um, caution in mind. She didn't want to make them very salty. So those are some good options if you're looking for, I know she has some soups on there, some recipes for soups. And the great thing about soups is you can make them in big batches and then freeze small portions of those. I do that all the time. And then, especially in the winter, I'll grab, I'll have several soups in there and I can grab whatever one, whichever ones uh, tastes good to me that day. So um, again, prepare, prepare it homemade if possible. Uh, if not, grab, always opt for the, the lower reduced sodium option at the grocery store. All right, good to know. Um, Lakeland, we have reached the end of our hour here, and we are unfortunately out of time. But I want to thank you again for another fantastic presentation and for being here with us. Thank you so much for a fantastic webinar. Thank you, Steve. Have a great rest of the day, everyone.